Good evening, everyone. There's still a few, if you're standing, there's still a few seats up here, and I think over here a few places. Welcome to tonight's Trinity Forum evening conversation with Dana Joya on why poetry matters. I'm Sheree Harder, the president of the Trinity Forum, and on behalf of all of us at the Forum, we are delighted that you are here. And we're also delighted to get to partner with Howard and Roberta Amundsen, who are our sponsors this evening, in getting to host what is sure to be a fascinating event. If you are new to the Trinity Forum, I know many of you seem to be new faces, a little bit about us. We exist to provide a space and resources for leaders to engage life's greatest questions in the context of faith. And the great questions of life have long been assumed to be inextricably linked to our notions of truth, beauty, and goodness. And historically, one of the most important means of discerning, contemplating, and internalizing those notions of truth, beauty, and goodness was the art and practice of poetry. It was through poetry that epics were passed down, that truths were internalized, that much of the Bible came to us, and that the great myths of civilization were transmitted. But over the last half century or so, poetry has become increasingly marginalized and largely ignored by the broader culture, relegated mainly to university English departments and the occasional Berkeley poetry slam. But our guest tonight, while he has been among the most outspoken critics for the current state of poetry, he will also make a provocative and countercultural arguments for its power and rightful priority. Dana Joya is both a renowned poet and a rather unusual one, and that he's also served as a marketing executive, a literary critic and essayist, as well as the head of a federal agency. Rarely do you find a corporate executive and a federal bureaucrat who is also a poet. <laughs> to, unpack <Thank> <laughs> to unpack each of those, Dana is currently the Poet Laureate of California. He has five full collections of poetry, including Daily Horoscope, Gods of Winter, which won the 1992 Poets Prize, Interrogations at Noon, which won the 2002 National Book Award, Pity the Beautiful, and his latest right off the press, 99 Poems, which you will have a chance to acquire tonight. He's an active translator of poetry from Latin, Italian, and German. He's composed three opera libretti. And in 2014, he won the Aiken Taylor Award for Lifetime Achievement in American Poetry. As a critic and an author, he has had no less of an impact. In fact, in 1992, his Atlantic Monthly article, Can Poetry Matter?, generated more responses than any other article published in the Atlantic Monthly to that date, as well as extending almost 20 years afterwards when it was finally knocked off that rank by some article the Atlantic published urging single women to settle. <laughs> He's published numerous books of criticism, including Can Poetry Matter? Essays on Poetry in American Culture, Disappearing Ink, Poetry at the End of a Print Culture, and The Barrier of a Common Language. His literary anthologies are numerous, including The Hundred Great Poets of the English Language, Literature, an Introduction to Fiction, Poetry, Drama, and Writing, and Literature for Life. In addition to that, his articles, reviews, and have appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The New York Times, The New York Times Book Review, Slate, The Hudson Review, and numerous other period articles as well. As the NEA chairman, Dana helped revitalize, reinvigorate, and perhaps save one of our country's most embattled agencies. He was appointed by President George W. Bush and unanimously confirmed by the Senate twice, no mean feat. It was Business Week who called him the man who saved the NEA. And for those arts uh, graduate students out there who are looking for a thesis topic, the story of how he did it is one that I would recommend to you. While at the NEA, he established Shakespeare in American communities, bringing Shakespeare to every congressional district in the nation. He established Operation Homecoming, which provided opportunities for returning veterans to write about their wartime experience. 
And he also created Poetry Out Loud, a national poetry recitation contest involving more than 15,000 high school students learning to memorize, recite, and perform poetry. He also created The Big Read, the largest literary program in the history of the country, encouraging reading through libraries across the country. Since leaving the NEA, Dana has been named the Judge Whitney Professor of Poetry and Public Culture at the University of Southern California. And in addition to his BA and, and MBA from Stanford, rather unusual to have a poet with an MBA, Dana also has a master's in comparative literature from Harvard and is the recipient of 10 honorary doctorates, as well as the Lotare Medal from the University of Notre Dame, an honor traditionally given to an American Roman Catholic in recognition of outstanding service to both the church and society. Tonight, I'll have an opportunity to interview Dana. After that, he will read some of his poems, and of course, then we will open it up to what's always perhaps the most dynamic time, questions from the audience. So Dana, welcome. We'll start right from the very beginning. You have an MBA. Uh, how did you become a poet? Bad luck, I guess. I don't know. Uh, I fell in love with poetry as a kid because my mother, who you know, working class Mexican woman who didn't have much education, loved poetry. She had gone to school in those evil, repressive days when school children were required to memorize great poems, uh, and th these were obviously extraordinarily valuable things in her, in her life, and she used to simply recite them. I mean, so, you know, she would, you know, be in the kitchen doing dishes, and she would go, it was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And, and so I, I fell in love with the, the bewitchment of poetry, the magic of poetry at a fairly early age, though it never occurred to me that I would be a poet. That happened when I was about 19 or 20, and then I had a problem. Um, I had very good parents, but they neglected to give me the private income I so richly deserved. <laughs> uh, I'm sure none of you have faced this indignity. And uh, moreover, I was the oldest kid in a big family uh, that had no money. And so I, it was required that I be practical. And that eventually led me to probably be the only person in human history who went to Stanford Business School to be a poet. You've been a frequent proponent of poetry recitation. You, know, you started the Poetry Out Loud contest. Why is it so important for us to speak and hear poetry rather than merely read it? I can give you reasons theoretical, historical, or practical. But I think the practical one is the most obvious. Most people think they don't like poetry. Most Americans believe they don't like poetry. But if they hear a good poem, well-spoken. They like it. And the reason is I think they don't like studying poetry as a kind of analytical art. And we've lost touch with the essential uh, element of poetry, which is its orality. Poetry is the oldest art that's still practiced by humanity. It goes back to a time that's prehistorical. Uh, poetry existed before there was writing and any other way to preserve uh, the past, traditions, uh, the history of, of, of a people. And so things that mattered were put into a form that was moving and memorable, which is to say that it was put into me to meters. Uh, and those allowed people to remember them. Uh, Robert Frost defined poetry uh, as, you know, once as a way of remembering what it would impoverish us to forget. And so poetry was at the center of a culture, but it was a performative art. It was essentially the same art as song. And I think that as poetry has moved away from that, it touches people less directly. And so we're in a culture right now where there's a small group of intellectuals which likes poetry a great deal, often because they're paid to profess it. Uh, but most people feel slightly alienated it. But I'm, I'm very old fashioned. I believe that, that art answers needs in people's lives. Oscar Wilde once said, uh, man hungers for beauty there is a void. And poetry is one of the things, in a sense, that feeds that appetite. 
and it does it most naturally as a form of musical speech. One of the themes that seems to come up repeatedly in your poems, uh, across the collections really, is both the power of words, but also silence, what is left unsaid. Why do you keep returning to this theme so often in your poems? I think you literally have poems entitled Unsaid. Yes. Um, well, if you're a poet, you're working with words, you're working with language, and if you're at all truthful, you understand to a certain degree, what can be said in words and what is beyond the power of words to, uh, to express. Words can imply it, but they can't express it quite literally. And I think also, you know, if, if you are a person of faith, if you are a person who prays, a person who has an inner life, you're aware of the profound uh, nature of your silences. Uh, you know, those things which are felt, that are intuited, that are imagined, that are remembered, that are never fully articulated. And, you know, uh, and, and, I, and so I think that what you're doing as a poet is to do everything you can with words without uh, denying what lays beyond words. Another, Does that make any sense to it you? It makes a okay, lot of okay. sense. Okay. Now, another thing that comes up, it's even come up in your titles, is that of time. You know, gods of winter, interrogations at noon. Uh, why is time important to you? And, and what do you hope to explore or gain by exploring this thing? Well, I think the older you get, uh, the more you'll understand what I'm about to say, is that uh, the, your, one of your primary experiences in reality is, uh, is being mortal, is having, uh, is, you know, a human life is a linear structure of time. And you're in a natural world which repeats itself. So every spring, everything is new again except for you. Um, and, and you're going through there. Uh, and if, you, if, you're, you know, if you're a Christian, you also believe that there is an eternity, that there is a level of existence that is outside of this linearity, outside of the natural cycle. And so time then becomes a reality uh, and a kind of paradox. And, and I think that, it, that poems uh, ponder the things that are important, and that strikes to me as one of the, of the important things. If we were not mortal, if we did not exist in time, why would we write poetry? Because you'd have forever, you know, and you could, you know, in a sense, nothing would matter. And you think of that in Greek mythology, the gods are bored, they're, uh, they're, you know, they're immoral because they're eternal, you know, nothing really matters to them. The world is a plaything to them. Let's talk a little bit about the purpose of poetry. At one point in one of your essays, you said that one of the purposes of poetry is to purify the language. What did you mean by that? Well, that's not my idea. Uh, that's uh, the, the Steph, you know, uh, Stéphane Mallarmé, the great French symbolist poet, wrote a poem about Edgar Allan Poe because you know Poe was rather ignored in the United States, but the French treated him as a god. He was the, you know, basically the, the founding figure of symbolism. And he said that, that poetry, and it, he was using it embodied in Poe, purified the language of the tribe, which I think he meant, and T.S. Eliot picks up on this and a number of other people say, is that you know, words are misused. You know, uh, words are inflated. They're forgotten. And one of the purposes of poetry is to use words in the fullness of their meaning and in, in the trueness of their meaning. Uh, and, and it's a kind of, it's a sacred responsibility of poets. And I, you know, and I think that, you know, we tend to think of language as an intellectual thing, but, but a language is a way that one human speaks to another in the fullness of their humanity. Uh, and it speaks intellectually, emotionally, it speaks to memories, and that's what a poet does. A poet is going to use, make two plus two equal eight, because you're using words in the fullness of their meaning, both of what is being said and what is unsaid, what is implied, what is suggested, what you yourself as the reader supplies. The older I get, the more I think that as a poet, I'm writing only part of a poem. It needs to be completed by the reader. And if I cannot bring the reader in as an equal and as a collaborator, I have failed as a poet. 
Now, presumably there is a public, even a political component to that as well. I think it was George Orwell who said that political chaos is connected with the decay of language. Does it mean that the decline of poetry is somehow responsible for the mess that we're in? I don't think you can blame that on poetry alone. Um, you know, but it's, uh, I mean, the, the, we're in an election year, and it doesn't matter who's running. Uh, you hear you always hear language misused in an election year. You'll hear it you misused in public speech. But you don't have to go to politics. You can go to marketing. You can go to education. You can go to any kind of institutional life. Every institution has a way of saying things which are not entirely true. You know, it's the, the politics of that institution. Uh, what I believe, I mean, you, poetry, like any art, can be misused. But I think at the, at the base of a poet's responsibility is to use tr language truthfully and powerfully to express that person's vision of reality powerfully. If you think of the society that we are in at the moment, to be able for an individual to register his or her individual experience in a responsible way truthfully has an astonishing cultural power. Because what we're both mostly hearing is corporate language, political language, uh, group language, which has been distorted to a greater or lesser degree you know, for the political concerns of that group, you know, that institution. In your seminal Atlantic Monthly article, you trace some of the reasons why poetry has become so marginalized over the half century. Uh, you pointed out the fairly prominent cultural role that poetry has played through the first couple hundred years of our, our country. Why has poetry become uh, so much relegated to the margins uh, of the cultural arena? Well, there's a, lot of, there's a number of, usually big historical changes don't happen from one thing. It's usually several things coming together. I'll start with one that people never talk about. For thousands of years, poetry was badly taught. Consequently, everyone loved it. Um, you know, it was used to teach history. It was used to teach elocution. Uh, you know, you had uh, uh, people reciting chorally as a kind of communal experience. You had all of these things, and it was people were allowed to enjoy it. To their knowledge of poetry was largely experiential. About 90 years ago, a group of brilliant Southerners came in. And, and taught us for the first time how to see poetry tr accurately, the, the new critics. And it's been, all been downhill since then. Because uh, you know, poetry has essentially become uh, a, a kind of a text on which to make analytical constructions. So I think the, the way poetry has been taught uh, has contributed to its decline. Uh, the fact that poetry has been institutionalized in creative writing programs. So you have these small professional groups, and I think it's a larger problem in terms of American society. Right now we have people, intellectuals, academics, they're brilliant at learning how to talk to one another, but they have collectively lost their ability um, to talk to the rest of society. Not entirely, but to a greater or lesser degree. I think this is bad for academics, and I think it's bad for society. Because I think society's intellectual, cultural health, health depends very much on a very lively uh, sort of conversation, a kind of art, series of arguments and dialectics. And the more uh, voices that can contribute in a way truthfully, in a kind of, in, you know, accurately, the more powerful uh, culture is. And instead, we've got a very bland, professional dialogue about poetry. For example, you almost never see an academic give a bad review to a book of poetry, because that person may be on your next promotion committee, your next grant committee, they may be on a prize committee. You know, so it's professional courtesy. And I think professional courtesy is the death of an art form. <laughs> One of the few places you, where you would think many Americans would be regularly exposed to poetry is in the Bible. Uh, close readers of the Bible know that the Psalms, uh, many of the books, are in the medium of poetry. And you would think this might have cultivated a familiarity and an affection for poetry among close readers of the Bible. But this doesn't seem to be the case. Any ideas why that might be? You know, once again, I think that if you go, you know, I don't think even Christians read the Bible enough. Uh, you know, they read certain passages, they tend to read glosses on it, but going, actually going back and rereading the whole book of Job, you know, you know, rereading the prophetic books. All the prophetic books are written uh, in verse. 
And so they, don't have, they have less experience. People have less experience of memorizing and reciting uh, you know, those poems. I think that they're read less and less even in services. And so you know, you know, the culture, we have a culture where everything's mediated. You know, so you read a book about reading the Bible rather than reading the Bible. You read a book about reading poetry, since criticism, rather than reading the primary texts. And it's good. I mean, it's, I'm not you know, denying the power of commentary, of criticism, but it's no substitute for the primary experience of reading uh, great works. And dare I say the, the Bible is the greatest of the great works? Where do you see signs of hope for poetry? Well, you know, I think it's interesting. Um, when we started Poetry Out Loud, this is a high, national high school poetry recitation contest. We did, I did it at the NEA. We were told by the state arts agencies that it was a bad idea. And it was a bad idea for three reasons. First of all, kids did not like poetry. Secondly, it was repressive to ask somebody to memorize a poem. And third, it was degrading to have the arts done in competition. Now this was obviously before American Idol and Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> uh, uh, so through the most complex uh, negotiations, we could, oh, there was only one of the, 40, of the 53 states, that's the way that federal, you know, we were working in federal government, that was supporting us. We convinced the other ones, and they allowed us to do one year. And what we discovered is that kids loved doing poetry that actually memorizing and reciting them was a really interesting thing because kids, if you give them a chance to, to immerse themselves in the arts, be it theater, music, poetry, a lot of kids like it. And third, when you did it in competition, it added a special energy. Now, in most poetry readings, about halfway through, the audience has fallen into a gentle slumber, and they're tired, who would deny them this pleasure? Uh, but it's interesting, when you do it in competition, people are leaning forward. They bring the same kind of special attention that they do a sporting event. Because when you're watching something in competition, you're triangulating it. You go, this is what I think of that person. This is what I bet they think. And this is the kind of, you know, the, the, where it's gonna end up. And so people, you'll have an audience of hundreds of people that will sit there for two hours while these kids do it. Plus there's a very interesting thing that happens when you sort of say, why did that kid pick that poem? And so it gives you this little human moment of discovery. And so, you know, uh, you know I, I'm not even sure what question I'm answering now, uh, you know, but what, what you see is you saw, see a, a kind of youthful energy that was brought into it. I think there's always hope. I think we are doomed the moment we believe that we cannot create the culture we want to live in, that we cannot create the society we want to live in. It's not going to happen easily. It's not going to be done, given to us on high. But you know, we can begin, as individuals, as members of organizations, uh, to create the things that we want to see. And a lot, a lot of times, when you have the right idea and you execute it, guess what? People get behind you. So at this point, we've had 3 million high school students that have participated in Poetry Out Loud, a program that was, had been predicted to fail you know, uh, at its very first offing. You mentioned audiences. I think it was Walt Whitman who said that to have great poets, you need great audiences. What makes an audience great? And what guidance would you give to potential audience members out there? Well, let me start by saying that I seem to be in a minority to believe that an art without an audience is a diminished thing. Uh, I don't, that's not the same as saying you've got to take your, your art and bring it down to the dumbest possible uh, level. But you know, think of somebody like Bob Dylan. Think of Bob Dylan's career. He's had a conversation, a dialectic with his audience you know, over half a century now. And that has been important to him as an artist and to the audience. I think audience members are, are most passionate when they feel they're engaged, uh, in a sense, you know, with a kind of a larger cultural exchange. So I think that, that art, be it the most difficult hermetic art or popular art, always takes into account the odd fact that somewhere along the line, another human being is going to encounter your work. And they were, are, these people are either going to engage with it or not. And 
you know, I, I don't think that Mozart would have disagreed with this or Shakespeare would have disagreed with this. They were people that respected their audience. I think the problem with a lot of, with a lot of artists is we do not respect our, our readers as equals. We you know, do not, in a sense, say, you, you know, for a poet, if a poem is any good, the, the people in this audience, say, everybody here has brought a different life into this room. Uh, you know, the, you, you, you know, different parts of your life, and that a poem that's good is going to have room for everybody to come in it in some way, and maybe do different things, but have a different kind of response. So, you, so to have you know, great art, you've got to have a room big enough for a great audience. And, you know, and I just think that's common sense, common cultural sense, common educational sense. So another form of engagement with poetry, of course, is review and criticism. And in your uh, original essay in 1991, you argued that one of the reasons for the decline of poetry was the rather abysmal state of criticism and review, both that it was rarely done and even more rarely done well. A, a generation later, has this changed? It's gotten even worse. Um, <laughs> it's, as far as I can tell, there's only one person left in America who gives bad poetry re reviews. Uh, a fellow named William Logan, a brilliant, brilliant critic, uh, usually an unhappy critic. You know, uh, but it's if you have been engaged to review a book, uh, I think your pact with the public is that you're going to you're going to portray your own reaction truthfully. Uh, you may like it, you may not. Usually, most reviews are mixed. Uh, but you know, if you, you th there should be a separation between the reviewer and the marketing department. You gave several suggestions for reinvigorating poetry in America, and I'd like for you to talk about some of those. But one in particular I wanted to ask you about, which is a rather counterintuitive one. You said that one of the most important ways to help reinvigorate poetry in America is that poets should read and perform other poets' work as well as their own. Mm -hmm. Why is that display of professional humility so important to the reinvigoration of poetry? Well, it's, a, it's, in one hand, humility, um, but it's also passion. I mean, the purpose, the reason that people have come to a poetry reading is because they love the art. They may love the artist in particular. More often, they sort of say, I've heard about this person. I, I don't know if they're any good or not. I guess I'll show up. Uh, you know, and I think that, that it is important to honor the art itself, you know, rather than just the ego of the poet. You know, you know, Poets, the, the controlling vice of poets is egotism. You know, I mean, it's, am I telling you anything you don't know? Uh, you know, the, uh, it, and so I think it's always good to have a certain perspective. I mean, uh, there's a, a number of Dominicans in the audience, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that somewhere Thomas Aquinas defined humility as seeing things as they really are, you know, uh, which is to, in a sense, see yourself in perspective. And that's one thing in the cosmos. But even the greatest poet is simply part of something very larger. What poetry is, and this is something rather magnificent, I think. Poetry is a conversation that has continued throughout humanity from its earliest uh, recorded moments. It's this conversation between the living and the dead in which if you, you begin by sort of listening into this rich, complicated conversation, then if you're very good, you get to enter it at some point. And if you're really great, somebody remembers that 100 years later. Uh, but just, you know, but I think we, we begin by honoring the conversation itself. Along those lines, who are your favorite poets, both living and dead? And perhaps you could recite one of their poems. OK. Um, I, uh, my favorite poet, and this is so banal, uh, and nobody ever says this, is William Shakespeare. I mean, I don't know if you have not heard of him. He's a comer. Uh, pay attention. Uh, but you know, among Americans, uh, and Robert Frost, uh, I think is the, I think he's the greatest of American poets. We have a great poetry, and I think he is our greatest poet. I love W. H. Auden, you know, who was born a British citizen and died an American citizen in Austria. Uh, you know, very interesting. I like Philip Larkin, you know, a very bleak, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, poet. Uh, but I could go on, but those, those, are, you know, those are a couple of the people that I, I like in particular. Uh, who, who would you like me to do? Uh, let's do a Robert Frost poem that nobody pays attention to. Um, it has a, an obscure biblical allusion, um, and once again, correct me if I'm wrong, which is, 
uh, when uh, King David was ill, they decided, you know, that maybe they could spruce him up, you know, by bringing in the fairest maiden of the field, and they put her in bed with David, but it didn't seem to work. Uh, her name was Abishag. And Robert Frost um, is, is, uh, read an article about a silent film actress who was you know, one of the most famous people in America who is now a charwoman. And he wrote this poem called Provide, Provide. That witch that came uh, with pail and rag to wash the steps, that withered hag was once the beauty Abishag, the picture pride of Hollywood. Too many fall from great and good for you to doubt the likelihood. Die early and avoid the fate. Or if predestined to die late, make up your mind to die in state. Make the stock exchange your own. If need be, occupy a throne where nobody can call you crone. Some have survived by what they knew, some by simply being true. What worked for them may work for you. No memories of having starred make up for later disregard or keep the end from being hard. Better to go down dignified with boughten friendship by your side than none at all. Provide, provide. <laughs> uh, I mean, that was, that was actually, uh, uh, there's a, there's a sense that says Washington, I have to give a political context. He wrote that also in response to the institution of social security. Uh, <laughs> certainly the finest poem ever written, inspired by Social Security. You've been considered a leader of the neo-formalist movement, which uh, recognizes and uses both rhyme and meter in your poetry, which goes against the current of much of academic poetry. Why do you believe rhyme and meter is so essential? Well, um, let me clarify first things. Is that we ne I never called myself a new formalist or a neo-formalist. That's what I was called. And you know, if that's when they want to call me, fine. Uh, I love rhyme and meter, but I don't believe poetry necessarily needs to be in rhyme and meter. What I believe is this. If you're writing it in the 21st century, you should have the ability to write in any technique that exists in the English language. Uh, the whole, you know, all of these available, you know, what kind of person doesn't want all the resources of his or her art available? And so that when you're writing a poem, sometimes it wants to be in rhyme, sometimes it wants to be in meter, sometimes it wants to be in free verse. So my poems fall about one third in free verse, one third in meter without rhyme, and one third in rhyme and meter. And, uh, you know, and I think that's the only way to write. Uh, others don't agree. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, you know, uh, I, you, I was, you know, the, the poet, you know, the new formalists have been accused of uh, of uh, reactionism, of political conservatism, of anglicism, of all these things from doing it. But you know, as if you know, uh, in fact, w one of these these fulminations, they said that Robert Frost wasn't an American poet because he wrote in rhyme and meter. And it seems to me any definition of American poetry which kicks Robert Frost out is probably not a very good one. Uh, you know, so, so my definition of American poetry is really quite radical. R American poetry is poetry written by Americans. Uh, you know, it doesn't even need to be in English. Uh, and, so, and so, you know, I just, it seems to me common sense. Now, on top of that, I love the particular magic that you can have with words when you use meters when you use rhyme schemes, when you use forms, when you use forms of repetition. Each of them has a slightly different effect. And actually, I tend to use uh, not traditional forms so much as little forms that I've invented using elements of that. And so, you know, and if Robert Frost said, you know, really, you know, uh, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. And I would say no fun for the writer, no fun for the reader. A po poetry's power presumably lies not just in our ability to hear it, but our ability to read it. But while you were the chairman of the NEA, one of the things that you instigated was one of the largest studies that the country had ever done on the state of reading in America. And the results that you gathered were really quite depressing, which found that reading as a whole was in decline, reading literature and poetry was in particular decline, reading comprehension was in decline. Yeah. Given that this has been the state of reading in America, which has only accelerated since you left office, how, what does that say for the future of poetry? Well, let me summarize. You know, uh, you know, you know I uh, 
had to bring these results to Congress, so I had to keep it simple. Um, you know, the, uh, so the, 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 the elaborate, hundreds of pages of tables can be summed up in three sentences. Americans are reading less, especially younger Americans. Two, which means that Americans are reading less well. The younger you are, the less well. And that reading less and reading less well have important consequences in the lives of individuals economically, educationally, civically, and socially. Um, and, we, and we could demonstrate this through, I mean, literally about 40 hard statistical studies. Uh, I mean, the first thing you do about this is you lament, you know, you pull your hair, you weep, and then the second thing you do is do something positive. Uh, we created this program called the Big Read. Uh, it was, we started it quickly, we moved it quickly, uh, we had it in every state in the country, and really by the time we left, we had 25,000 organizations working with us in partnership, and guess what happened? Uh, for the first time in al almost three decades, of steady decline in reading, reading, adult reading went up in the United States. Adult, we measure adult because that's when you're out of school, 18 and plus. And what that says is that you can change the trends that are affecting this country. Uh, the program has been backed off of, some other programs that were similar have been backed off of, and this, the numbers have fallen down again. But you know, uh, I, I think it's very simple, reading, is a transformative individual and social act. Communities of people who, who can read and read well perform better uh, than those that don't. It has important consequences if we do not find ways to support and perpetuate the power of reading, uh, America is going to suffer. Not simply you know, uh, culturally, but civically. Uh, people who read vote more. They, they do volunteer work, you know, vastly higher levels. They, do, uh, they, they give to charities at more level. More surprisingly, readers even exercise more than non-readers. I mean, so, you know, uh, so, and guess what? Uh, is there anybody in this room who doesn't know, in a sense, from their spiritual life, the transformation that occurs through reading? And th that's what we're trying to, you know, to, to, to perpetuate, because I, I think it's really at the core of a free society. One of the great debates that your Atlantic Monthly article first ignited was... You know, it's, whenever we you know, you talk about Dana Joy, the word debate always comes up. I mean, you know, it's sort of sad, isn't it? <laughs> no, own it, own it. <laughs> was your dream that poetry would once again be part of mainstream popular culture? If this were to happen, what would be the signs that your dream is coming true? Well, there's something really weird that's been happening now for a couple of decades, and I've been taking notes on it. I, I haven't uh, written this article up, but I'll, I'll, I will give my, my, my wisdom to you gratis. Uh, the, about 30 years ago, I noticed that every now and then a poem would be quoted in a movie. Uh, this is accelerated and accelerated. I cannot watch TV without having to get up and write down the quotations that are happening. And I think it's because there's this desperate need for this. And these people that are writing these scripts are, are literary people, and they're sort of caught in a culture which doesn't do it. So you see this kind of, once again, man hungers for beauty. There is a void. But what I, what I would see, and, I, and I've begun to see this. I mean, this is really, I think, the main difference between when I wrote uh, poetry, Can Poetry Matter and now, is that there's been an, an emergence of poetry outside the university. Uh, and you can see it in any number of ways. You can see it in poetry slams. Uh, you can see it in poetry being read on the radio. You can see it in hip hop poetry. You can see it in cowboy poetry. Uh, new formalism is all, mostly people that are not, uh, you know, not teachers. I go to, to uh, uh, give readings in public libraries. Uh, we get large audiences, they're not academics. And I think what it is, what is, what is hip hop, new formalism, poetry slams, poetry out loud, cowboy poetry have in common? It's all spoken. It's performative, it's social. If you think of the power of art, when people come together, you know, uh, in a sense, share a space, share a reaction, it's an extraordinarily powerful civic moment. 
Uh, you see this with theater. You see this with symphonic music. You see this with, you know, with dance and performance. And I think what poetry is gradually doing is recovering a little bit of its civic space, even on television. Before we hear some of your poems and then turn to audience questions, close readers of your poetry will notice that certain themes keep coming up, which may be unusual among modern poetry, including sin, redemption, grace, and other themes. Has your faith affected your poetry? I'm a cradle Catholic. Um, I went to, you know, eight years with the Sisters of Providence, four years with the Marianists. You know, I, I go to Mass. Uh, I'm a Catholic. I'm a Catholic, you know, down to the tips of my toes. Uh, and so the funny thing is that most of my poetry is not in any overt sense religious, but, you know, you reflect your worldview. And my worldview is, is that we live in a fallen world. Uh, we are faced with our imperfections. Uh, we long to transcend this. Uh, we, uh, we ask for grace and hope for redemption. And the funny thing is that I would write these narratives, and I would think of them, it's about a murderer, it's about a, you know, the, uh, you know, a, you know, a person who's, you know, perishing thing. And then about a year later, I'd read it, and I'd say, that's, that is such a Catholic allegory, you know? But it's, you know, it's operating at a subconscious level, which I think is good. I think it's very hard, uh, and maybe you, you, people disagree with me in this. I think it's very hard to write poetry using the language of faith, because the, you know, the language is sort of received language. It's communal language. And I think what we have to do is, you know, if, you're tr if you're writing about these mysteries, the mysteries of our existence, you know, what we have to do is, in a sense, reinvent the experience from the ground up, you know, uh, you know with the vividness of something you're discovering for the first time. And uh, that's what one tries to do. It's kind of hard. Mm -hmm. um, Perhaps you could share some of those poems with us. If you insist. Uh, <laughs> So let's, I've got something, uh, I think I'm, my wife, okay, and there I go. Someone had hopefully taped me to the chair, you know, trying to keep me from the podium. Um, I thought I would, you know, just do about eight poems, a um, variety of, of different, different things. I wrote a couple of them down here, let's see, here it is. Um, uh, let me begin, uh, something going on in the next room there, I'm not quite sure what, but. I will give it a run for its money. Um, uh, I, I, I'm from a town called Hawthorne, California. Uh, it, who knows Hawthorne here? I got a couple of people, you know. I mean, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's a really rough working class urban neighborhood. There's about two trees in the entire uh, city, city, you know, boundaries. And so I never, my, my parents always had two jobs and stuff, so we never took vacations. So I never saw nature until I was uh, 18. Uh, and I went up to college and suddenly I was in Stanford and there was nature around me. And this is about the first time I ever really experienced a spring. I was with uh, a, a young lady that I was in love with. Uh, um, unsuccessfully, I guess would be the right word to use. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, you know, it's about going to this uh, apple farm. Actually, ironically, it's it's right around where I live now in Sonoma County. Uh, it's a love poem, but as a, a, a friend of mine said, Dana, when you write a, a poem about a, a young man and a woman uh, in a garden with an apple, it's about something else too. Uh, it's called The Apple Orchard. And it, this is written years later and addressed to this woman, who I'm sure doesn't even remember this experience. The Apple Orchard. You won't remember it. The apple orchard we wandered through one April afternoon, climbing the hill behind the empty farm. A city boy, I'd never seen a grove burst in full flower or breathe the bitter sweet perfume of blossoms mingled with the dust. A quarter mile of trees and fragrant rows arching above us, we walked the aisle alone in spring's ephemeral cathedral. We had the luck, if you can call it that, of having been in love, but never lovers, the bright flame burning, fed by pure desire. Nothing consumed, 
such secrets brought to light. There was a moment when I stood behind you, reached out to spin you toward me, but I stopped. What more could I have wanted from that day? Everything, of course. Perhaps that was the point, to learn that what to learn that what we will not grasp is lost. Um, there's a, a type of, of statue, a religious statue in uh, southwestern United States. It's, it's, uh, car it was carved out of wood, usually by a local artisan, called Santos, Santa. The, it's the virgins, it's the saints. Um, and they were used for either home altars or small rural churches. This is a poem uh, spoken by a santo. Uh, the santo is a Mexican statue, um, and it's been damaged in the Mexican Revolution when the troops came and, and basically, you know, the Catholic Church was, was, was outlawed. And it's now in a museum. And this is a poem about the difference between a work of art that's created for uh, devotion that is then transferred into a situation where it's for aesthetic contemplation. And indeed, this is most of the, of the, con you know, of the contents of, of museums are this way. Uh, a, little, a little rickety here. Uh, the, it's called The Angel with the Broken Wing. I am the angel with the broken wing, the one large statue in this quiet room. The staff finds me too fierce. And so they shut faith's ardor in this air-conditioned tomb. The docents praise my elegant design above the chatter of the gallery. Perhaps I am a masterpiece of sorts, the perfect emblem of futility. Mendoza carved me for a country church. His name's forgotten now, except by me. I stood beside the gilded altar where the hopeless offered God their misery. I heard their women whispering at my feet, prayers for the lost, the dying, and the dead. Their candles stretched my shadows up the wall, and I became the hungers that they fed. I lost my left wing in the revolution. Even a saint can savor irony. When troops were sent to vandalize the chapel, they hit me once almost apologetically, for even the godless feel something in a church, a twinge of hope, fear, who knows what it is, a trembling unaccounted by their laws, an ancient memory that they can't dismiss. There is so much, I must tell God, the howling of the damned won't reach so high, but I stand here like a dead thing nailed to a perch, a crippled saint against a painted sky. Now, uh, uh, now, now I want to do an L.A. poem, um, you know, which is the, the city, at least in the popular imagination, of beautiful people. And, you know, the, the beautiful always seem to have life easier than the rest of us. I mean, I don't is, I don't is, think we have any, you know, anyway, you know, I won't comment on the looks of the audience, but uh, the, uh, you, know, I, I, you have to take that on faith. And, and, but there's a certain price to beauty, which is that when it passes, you don't develop the toughness that we ugly people do. Uh, and so this is a poem ab uh, about that. Uh, and I wrote, it, I wrote it in the form of a popular song. I was writing it with, for a jazz musician named Helen Sung, who's doing a jazz song cycle. And I wanted you know, to use slang the way you do in this, to get, have a poem the way the Elizabethans would write with the transparency of a song. Pity the beautiful. Pity the beautiful, the dolls and the dishes, the babes with big daddies granting their wishes. Pity the pretty boys, the hunks and Apollos, the golden lads whom success always follows, the hotties, the knockouts, the tens out of ten, the drop-dead gorgeous, the great leading men. Pity the faded, the bloated, 
the blousy, the paunchy Adonis whose locks turned lousy. Pity the gods, no longer divine. Pity the night, the stars lose their shine. Uh, and now this is a poem in free verse, just to say, show you how, the, you know, I think one of the ways you can use free verse, which still has a kind of musicality, this is a Washington poem. It's called Money. Uh, <laughs> money, the long green. Cash, stash, rhino, jack, or just plain dough. To be made of it, to have it to burn. Greenbacks, double eagles, mega bucks, or Ginny Mays. It greases the palm, feathers the nest, holds heads above water, makes both ends meet. Money breeds money, gathering interest, compounding daily, always in circulation. Money, you don't know where it's been, but you put it where your mouth is, and it talks. Uh, the, uh, uh, now, I, I want to talk about something. Being a poet is a very odd business in a lot of ways, uh, if you can even call it a business. Uh, and you learn certain things that um, poets don't usually admit. And uh, one of the things that I've learned, uh, and I think that you sort of, as a reader, you might already know this, which is that you, if you write a poem, to a certain degree, you're creating a construction of language that has a life of its own. And it's kind of like your kids, when it's ready, it moves away, and it does all kinds of things you may or may not approve of. Uh, you know, but it has this kind of thing. And so what I've discovered is that my poems have a meaning, sometimes which I did not intend, but which is there. And that is actually a sign of their strength rather than of you know, uh, my weakness, or at least I like to believe that. Um, and I'll, I want to give you this example. Uh, I wrote a poem, and it, it's, it's called Reunion. And it's about this notion of coming to a place where you should know everybody, but you really don't. You know, and, and, you know, and it's like, and you just, you realize how, you know, especially in a big society like ours, how much of a stranger you are, even in your own hometown or your own school. And I wrote this poem, and I sent it to this editor, and who had wanted a poem, and he says, oh, Dana, this is my favorite kind of your poem. It's one of your Twilight Zone poems, you know? And it's, you know, and it's very much like, an, you know, an experience of the Twilight Zones. And I, I consider that a great compliment. Uh, you know, Rod Serling is one of my heroes. A uh, number of years later, it came out in a book, and I went to a reading, and there was a woman that I'd known as an undergraduate, and she came to the reading, and she had a copy of the poem framed. And she said, look at this, and I said, wow. Then she turned it around, and there was a picture of her father. And she said, you know, my father has Alzheimer's, and you gave me the poem that, by which I understand how he feels. And I realized she was right. Reunion. This is my past where no one knows me. These are my friends whom I can't name. Here in a field where no one chose me, the face is different, the voice is the same. Why does the stranger rise to greet me? What is the joke that makes him smile as he calls his children together to meet me, bringing them forward in single file? I nod, pretending to recognize them, not knowing exactly what I should say. Why? Does my presence seem to surprise them? Who is the woman who turns away? Is this my home or an illusion? The bread on the table smells achingly real. Must I at last solve my confusion? Or is confusion all I can feel? Uh, this is a, a short poem. It's a, my wife and I lost our first son at uh, four months of sudden infant death syndrome. And, you know, uh, I don't, if in, it's probably someone in this audience who's lost a child, but if not, you understand it just changes your life. And I don't want to talk about the process of loss. I want to talk about something that's sort of odd that happens thereafter, which is that 
ever thereafter, whenever you see a child who would be about the same age as your child, you say, that's what my boy would be doing. That's what my son would look like now. And so your child has a kind of phantom second existence. Uh, and this is about that. And I wrote this poem on what would have been my son's 21st birthday. And it's called Majority, you know, in that legal sense. Now you'd be three, I said to myself, seeing a child born the same summer as you. Now you'd be six or seven or ten. I watched you grow in foreign bodies, leaping into a pool, all laughter, or frowning over a keyboard, but mostly just standing, taller each time. How splendid your most mundane actions seemed in these joyful proxies. I often held back tears. Now you are 21. Finally it makes sense that you have moved away into your own afterlife. I think I'll just do two more poems. Uh, here's one I don't read uh, uh, really ever, because it's, you know, uh, it's called The Seven Deadly Sins. Um, and it occurred to me that, you know, The Seven Deadly Sins, they kind of hang out together. And this is about them all going into a diner uh, <laughs> with a potential client. Uh, and uh, and we, we should all know what the deadliest of this, you know, The Seven Deadly Sins, just to remind you, I mean, I probably... People in this, in this room have practiced all seven of them this week. Uh, avarice, envy, anger, sloth, gluttony, lust, and pride. And we should all know what the most dangerous of the seven sins is pride. Uh, at least Dante felt so. Uh, the seven deadly sins. Forget about the other six, says pride. They're only using you. <laughs> Admittedly, lust is a looker but you can do better. And why do they keep bringing us to this cheesy dive? The food is so bad that even gluttony can't finish his meal. Notice how avarice keeps refilling his glass whenever he thinks you're not looking, while envy eyes your plate. Hell, we're not even done, and anger is already arguing about the bill. I'm the only one who ever leaves a decent tip. Let them all go, the losers. Uh, it's a relief to see Sloth's fat ass go out the door. <laughs> but stick around. I have a story that not everyone appreciates about the special satisfaction of staying on board as the last grubby lifeboat pushes away. Uh, and then uh, I'll end with a, uh, the most recent poem in the book. Um, I think one of the hardest subjects to write about is a happy marriage. Um, and it's because, um, first of all, it's always easier to write about the dark emotions or the dramatic emotions, but also a marriage has a kind of strange private quality. In a marriage, you begin, your wife and you, you know, or your spouse and you begin to, in a sense, create a private language, jokes, allusions that only you understand, uh, nonverbal signals uh, that, you know, uh, you understand. I know immediately at 50 feet when my wife disapproves of something, you know? Uh, <laughs> knowing that is one of the reasons I've been married 36 years. Um, and so I was trying to dis to to do this, and, and the metaphor I came up with is you think of these vanishing tribes, they only have maybe two or three speakers, and when they go, their language goes, their myths, their customs, uh, and this struck me as a kind of metaphor for this, this private world that exists between the two of you. Marriage of many years. Most of what happens, happens beyond words. The lexicon of lip and fingertip, 
defies translation into common speech. I recognize the musk of your dark hair. It always thrills me, though I can't describe it. My finger on your thigh does not touch skin. It touches your skin, warming to my touch. You are a language I have learned by heart. This intimate patois will vanish with us. It's only native speakers. Does it matter? Our tribal chants, our dances round the fire, performed the sorcery we most required. They bound us in a spell time cannot break. Let the young vaunt their ecstasy. We keep our tribe of two in solemn secrecy. What must be lost was never lost on us. Okay? So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Now, do you, do you. Do you want me to go? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So now comes one of the most interesting times of an evening conversation where we get to hear from you. So if you have questions, our only rules are simple. Those of you who have been here before know them. We just simply ask you that you keep all of your questions brief, civil, and in the form of a question. If you could raise your hand and be called on. We have mics coming around so people can hear you uh, right up here in the front. Thank you. Um, you spoke about poetry moving out of the university, which a number of us feel is a healthy thing. My question is, do you think things like rap and hip hop and other forms of modern poetry, if we can call it that, are indeed a healthy development? Well, what poetry is, is a special way of speaking that invites and rewards a special you know, way of listening. And it's a language. And in a language, you can say anything. You can say simple things, complex things, tragic things, funny things. Um, and I believe there's a certain power of keeping that language as broad, as inclusive, and as dynamic as possible. Uh, that does, I think actually hip hop is an extremely interesting phenomenon. Here's my interpretation of hip hop. Uh, American intellectuals and academics took poetry away from the common people, and so they reinvented it for themselves. Uh, how can one not feel the, the nobility of that gesture? That being said, I don't necessarily think Snoop Dogg is the new Shakespeare. Uh, and it's a commercial category that I think has been largely marketed to, to adolescent, you know, middle class kids with gangster fantasies, but the, the form of hip hop is really quite interesting, and, and I think that over time it may develop into a significant art form. What we've seen in our time with hip hop, and this is interesting, the reinvention of oral poetry. We've seen what happens. Now, was it, uh, I've reprinted a, some lyrics in a textbook I did. Of, I, I was actually the first, you know, you, this, maybe this won't make me popular here, the first you know, literary person who actually reprinted a hip hop lyric in a standard anthology. And I wrote it you know, to these artists and they said, can you send us a copy? And I said, yeah, I'd be happy to. So they said, we've never seen it written down. You know, Homer would have said the same thing. Uh, uh, you know, so, you know, of course, with Homer, he, could, he was blind and there was no writing, so it had been a more complicated <laughs> statement. Uh, but so, so, you know, but I think that the, 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 we should, uh, the, the invention of these new media for poetry is a good thing. And I think that the people, in a sense, invent an art form to talk about their own experience is, is you know, is, is good. I think it's an unqualified good. Thank you very much. Uh, where do you go to find uh, contemporary poetry written today? What are your sources for that? Well, it should be easy. Uh, it sh there should be you, know, you should be able to go to the bookstore, get an anthology, and uh, honestly believe that every poem in the anthology the editor thought was so good that he or she wanted to share with you. 
Nowadays, you get a lot of anthologies, and I don't think that's the criteria. It's this, the, the, like, I remember, and I can't put your matter, I talked about one anthology. I said it's, it's 104 leading American poets, and it's really the 104 people in charge of 104 creative writing departments, you know, basically. So, uh, but I think what, you know, what you have to do nowadays is you have to do a lot of digging for yourself, but the, the shortest way is always to ask someone who knows more than you to recommend something that they really like. Uh, and, uh, you know, but I think with the, with the demise of, of anthologies and uh, honest criticism, that's harder. Um, there's another thing that's going on with anthologies, too, and I say this as an anthologist myself, is the, pri the re reprint costs of anthologies have become outrageous. And so no one can afford to do the anthology that they want uh, because, of, because of the cost of it. And that's one of the reasons why textbook costs are going up so much. I mean, I'm embarrassed by what students have to pay for the anthologies, you know, that I've edited for, you know. Uh, and, but it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, a problem. But I think ask people whose judgment you trust or find one or two critics that you, you, you seem to trust. Well, let, let me just say something. You want some recommendations? Richard Wilbur, Kay Ryan, uh, David Mason, Alicia Stallings, maybe Charles Simic, uh, Julia Alvarez. That's just, you know, I think six, six suggestions that are, you know, that are, you can't go wrong with. I was glad that you chose for your reading to do a variety of poetry. Um, it seems that it's more popular for publishers right now to publish thematic books of poetry. Can you comment on that? You are so right. Um, you know, I th I see, I th the, 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 the problem is, is that you've got a lot of people that feel they should publish poetry, but they, they're unsure of their own taste. I mean, the aftermath of modernism is that in the early 21st century, nobody trusts their tastes about art because there's all these things they've been told they don't like. And that's, you know, I don't know what to say except that if, you know, that intelligent people, you know, have to have honest responses. So what happens is they sort of say, well, here's a, a book that's all about um, a plane that went down in Alaska. And then and you sort of know what every poem is kind of about. But the trouble is that even a really good poet probably can't write 30 good poems on the same subject in a period of 18 months or whatever. Shakespeare was able to do it. Rainier Maria Rilke was able to do it, but not a lot of other. So I, I think it's actually a kind of fallback. I think that poet probably wrote 20 poems out of which they should have excerpted one or two. But I, I think that variety is, the, is a sign of artistic vitality. Um, but it's, it's, it's increasingly rare these days. I mean, the critics, critics feel more comfortable because, once again, they, they know how to review a book if all the poems are on the same subject, especially if it's an extra literary subject. What do you say when someone says to you, I don't like poetry, I don't understand it, and it makes me feel stupid? I hear that a lot, and I, I, I feel sorry for them, because I think p poetry is one of the pleasures of life. It would be like somebody saying, I don't like classical music. And I say, well, gee, you know, if you just, and so what I try to do is just to suggest how easy it is, in a sense, to do this, which is, to, you know, to Read one poem a day. Get a get a book of a well-known poet. I mean, get Shakespeare's sonnets. Get, um, I mean, depending on you know, you know, I w probably wouldn't start with Duino's Duino elegies by Rilke or something like that. It's really hard. But you know, take a you know, Houseman or Thomas Hardy or Elizabeth Bishop, uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, Robert Hayden. These are all wonderful poets. Just read a poem a day. Get a good anthology and just read a poem a day. But better yet is to, is to what I'll do is I'll recite them a poem. Uh, and they go, well, that's good, I didn't, you know. Uh, uh, I'm not talking about one of my own poems, by the way, but you know, and, and I think it's just that poetry has been made inexpressibly boring uh, by the way that it's taught. I mean, if every time you were given a piece of music, they would then take, you know, turn the music off and say, now let's write an analysis of the chord structure, people wouldn't want to hear music either. I mean, it would, you'd almost, it's almost like, B.F. Skinner's uh, negative conditioning. Uh, so, uh, 
So you know, so you know, but but I think I but I think it's a very common thing. Is that um, one of the once again the reactions of the 21st century is that we feel that if we don't like a work of art, it's our problem, rather than the work of art. Now, in some cases, there are very great works of art that are very challenging at first, but sometimes you, you'll you'll get, come across a poem in the New Yorker, and it's a stinker. You know, and, and the problem is not your fault. It's you know, it's it lies in the institution's judgment. Um, can you tell us about a memorable poetry reading that you have attended and give us some details and why it was so, what made it truly memorable? Well, you know, there's a lot of poets who are very good poets um, who are not very good at reading their work. And there are other poets who are really quite uh, wonderful. There's a poet, uh, he's an American who lived in England. His name is Mike, or his name was Michael Donaghy. Uh, he was actually uh, born in the Bronx, born and raised in the Bronx. Uh, you know, sort of Irish, his parents were Irish immigrants. And he, he died at the age of 50 of a heart attack. Um, but Michael Donaghy was the best reader of poetry I have ever heard. He had rather complicated uh, metaphysical poems, but you had this sense of, uh, when he, he read them, as if they were being created out of the very moment. And he was able to do that while never losing the musical line of it. And so, you know, I really thought he was something special. Uh, there's a couple of poets, that, unfortunately, they're passed away to Anthony Hecht, uh, uh, and uh, Donald Justice were really wonderful readers in their own way. Richard Wilbur, who, God bless him, is alive at 95, uh, you know, living up in Massachusetts, was the same thing. There was a kind of natural grace. And, and I think that when poetry can uh, sound like speech bewitched by song, that's when it's most effective. Uh, and so I think that he's really worth Kay Ryan who was poet laureate about seven or eight years ago, uh, she's the same way. Her poems are very short, very metaphysical, and when and she speaks them, you know, they unfold. I think, I think she's really quite, quite uh, you know, uh, wonderful too. Um, but there's, those are just some examples. But a lot of times you'll hear a poet who even is a good poet, and the poems don't quite come off the page. And I think that's, that's a loss. In that case, I'd almost rather read them. Um, I was thinking, so Richard Will, or sorry, um, Auden's For the Time Being was, I think, originally a libretto. Yeah. Um, and then Benjamin Britten said, heck no, and now it's a poem. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, whether there's a, a distinction. Are, are lyrics like a, a species of poetry? And why has, um, why have they like, not had the same decline that poetry has? Well, Do people still know lyrics? Well, it's, very, it, well, it's, it's a couple questions you're asking that are kind of, um, and they're complicated questions. The, the, for Auden, Benjamin, you know, Auden wrote one of the great poems of the 20th century, For the Time Being. It's a meditation on the, on the incarnation and the nativity. It's a, he called it the Christmas Oratorio, and Britain was supposed to set it to music, but it's about 100 pages long. You know, <laughs> you know Britain said it would take days. It would make Wagner you know, look like a minimalist. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, uh, you, know, he, he's, you know, Britain set one little chorus and then just gave up. Uh, but, and so that, that's that particular case, and it, you know, but it's a great poem, and I'm glad that, you know, that, you know if Auden hadn't written it, uh, the English literature would have been the poor thing. See, libretti are not well understood in English, because by and large, most operas until quite recently, until basically Benjamin Britten, were in Italian or French or German, and people read them in very bad rhymed translations, usually with cuts, you know? And so, uh, and so it, the, you know, the uh, poetry was seen as a kind of uh, doggerel when it was, but if you read these, uh, in Italian, if you read the, the, you know, the libretti of Felice Romani, who wrote uh, all, most of the libretti for Bellini and for Donizetti, it's, or Arrigo Boito, who wrote you know, uh, Otello, Falstaff, 
uh, the revision of Simone Bocanegra for Verdi, the poetry is superb. Uh, Puccini's libretti are superb uh, in Italian, but you know, as Frost said, poetry is what gets lost in the translation. Um, even today, if you go to the Metropolitan Opera and you read the libretto of La Traviata, it has mistakes. Uh, it has inventions uh, in it. You know, I mean, I use it teaching a class, and, and, and you know, you can just, you know, it's just not an adequate translation. But people don't tend to pay attention. Uh, if I were a poet in the year were 1600, I would be expected to write poems in the conventional sense of lyrics, novels, I mean, which is to say narrative poems. I would write plays, I would write masks, I would write hymns, I would write anthems, I would write popular songs, uh, and things like this. You know, once again, verse is a language, and you can say anything in that language. The dilemma, I think, for the, a poet at the end of the 20th century, which is sort of when I, where I was starting out, was that you were exposed to, rather than doing all of these things, write short lyric utterances that fit on one typewritten page to be published at the bottom of a page of a magazine. Uh, and that just struck me as kind of boring. Uh, I wanted to regain ground for poetry. I didn't read any of my narrative poems uh, tonight. I've got in the longer poems. I think those may be the best things that I've done as a poet, you know, but they take about 15, 20 minutes to read. I've recovered, I, I hope, please, I know I sound megalomaniac, don't I? Uh, maybe I should start speaking in the first person plural. You know, we have recovered. Uh, the, uh, you know, I was trying to recover some of the territory, you know, from prose. I've collaborated with lots of musicians, and it's a great pleasure because you bring out a different side of yourself. If I'm writing a libretto and it's about a vampire, you know, it's a side of myself that I, at least I don't think I express daily, <laughs> maybe nightly, I don't know. Uh, the, uh, and so you, it allows you, writing dramas, writing songs, allows you, I think as an artist, to, to try things that are rather different that wouldn't happen if you were writing just a short, you know, lyric poem for the page. Plus, there's the pleasure of working with singers, with musicians, with dancers, with directors. And I, and I love the communal aspect of the arts. Uh, and it's, to me, it's a great pleasure. One of the nice things about musicians, unlike poets, musicians are the kids that learned how to play with the other children. You know, and they, they've got a natural collaborative quality versus poets who would mostly, you know, like me, much more be unhappy by themselves, you know. <laughs> One last question, right here. Uh, you, you said at the outset that we... Um, I'm, I'm sorry to be ignoring this side of the audience, uh, but I can't I literally have, I have to reach over to see you. You said at the outset that we are responsible for the culture in which we are a part. And one of the concerns I have is what appears to be the coarsening of the language that is used in society. Um, that is reflected not only on what you hear on the streets, but what you see in probably our most dominant art uh, media, which is film. Mm -hmm. um, is that a concern to you? And if so, what do we do or what can be done to change the course of that? I do share the concern. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm staggered by the Im imbecility of most of the movie scripts that you see, not simply in the coarsening of language, but the absence of dramatic reason in many cases. You know, that, you know if, if you can blow it up, why worry about continuity? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but I think the answer to this and a lot of things is that we have to take it upon ourselves to embody the principles that we champion. Uh, I think that you know, as teachers, as writers, as citizens, we need to embody eloquence. We need to embody eloquence as, as something that's fresh, not pretentious, that's immediate, that's accurate, that's vivid. And so I think there's a kind of a collapse of, of linguistic panache, skill, the joy of actually using words to describe, you know, uh, what life is like to us. And, and, but I do think, it's the same way, if you're, uh, how do you improve morals? Well, you start with yourself. You know, how do you improve behavior? You know, uh, and, and I think that the power of example, the power of modeling, 
is, is under, under um, recognized in our society. So that's what I do. I think we should, be, we should try to speak as well as, and write as well and teach as well and lecture as well as we possibly can because language has a social and civic importance in and of itself. We have to purify the language of the tribe. So I brought it back to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. As we wrap up tonight, I just want to direct your attention to an invitation that is on everyone's chair, and that is to join the Trinity Forum Society. As you have probably gathered, even if this is your first time here, we are trying to do something unique and something fairly countercultural in an environment that's characterized by triviality, polarization. We're trying to provide a forum to talk about what matters most in a way that is both intellectually rigorous and warmly hospitable. We thank you for being here tonight. We hope that you will do that. To sweeten the offer yet further, I'll tell you about a few of the benefits. Members of the Trinity Forum Society receive our quarterly readings where we try to take a classic or contemporary piece of literature or letters that raises some of those big questions of life. Uh, and make those available to you, as well as our daily What We're Reading updates and our monthly podcast with leaders like Dana Joya. I'll also just let you know that our upcoming reading this summer features an introduction by Dana of the poems of Gerard Manley Hopkins. It is not to be missed, uh, and if that doesn't sweeten the pot, I don't know what else will, except that if you join tonight, we will provide you with a free copy of Dana's book, 99 poems. Uh, I highly commend it to you. This is the result of his, uh, all five of his collections. He's taken the best from them. They will also be on sale tonight right outside the door for $24 each. Uh, Dana will be around to sign those books, so we highly commend those to you. Also, hope you can join us next time. Our next event will be May 23rd in this very room. We will be launching a series on faith and international development. And our inaugural speaker will be Mike Gerson, who some of you know, who is always just not to be missed, and hope you'll join us for that. Finally, it's always appropriate to end with thanks, and uh, there are certainly several people to be thanked. We're deeply grateful to Howard and Roberta Amundsen, whose sponsorship made this evening possible. I'd also just like to recognize two people in the audience. We're really delighted to have our trustee, Byron Smith, up here from Nashville, as well as to be joined by Mary Joya. So Mary, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, <laughs> I'd also just like to thank my Cracker Jack team, who they stay in the background while they do an incredible job. Margaret Eberly, who's our head of events and membership, Colleen O'Malley, Alyssa Abraham, our fantastic interns, Britta Friesen, Drew Masterson, and Ben Strubel, as well as our volunteers, Carrie Lucas, who used to be an intern, who's back for the evening, and photographer Zach Miller. Really appreciate your help and effort. Finally, thank you again, Dana. Thank you all for coming, and good night. <laughs>